We're continuing on in our series this year, just focusing on, uh, on the Word of God and, and just really pulling out bits and pieces as we go through. We've gone through all of Matthew chapter 7, um, and now we're kicking off Matthew chapter 8. However, before we get too far along in Matthew chapter 8, what I want to do is I want to go back a couple of verses in Matthew chapter 7 because it, it ties in together. You know, we have chapters and we have verses and we have them all numbered. When, when these letters were originally written, they didn't have numbers in them. It was just a letter. It was just something that somebody was writing and penning. And so uh, it's important to see that sometimes this stuff all just kind of goes together. And, and if we read a few verses in, at the end of Matthew chapter 7, it kinda, I think it kind of helps us understand a little bit more about Matthew chapter 8 as we get into it. So I want to go back and read a little bit, and then we'll talk about it. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 28. My Bible says this. It says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, so these things that, that Matthew's referring to, he's just finishing the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is up on the mountain. He's been talking for, for a while, teaching all kinds of good things. And so that's what he's referring to. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he taught with real authority. If you have your Bible or your app or something on the underline or highlight that. Uh, he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. So the, Matthew's making a difference. There's something different about the way Jesus taught with what they've heard. And I think that's an important note for us to make. And then we get into Matthew chapter 8. Verse 1. He says this. Large crowds followed Jesus as he came down the mountainside. And suddenly a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. Lord, the man said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. Then Jesus said to him, don't tell anybody about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. Now there's all kinds of stuff in here, and, and obviously this Matthew chapter 8, we start looking at Jesus healing people. And now we're a Pentecostal church. We believe that God heals today. We believe He touches and He heals. But I also know this. I know that, that when, as soon as we start talking about healing within the church, for a lot of us it can throw in a whole bunch of confusion. It can, it can cause a lot of strife, confusion, trouble even, anxiety, because, because we don't fully understand it, and, 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 and I don't. I, I, a story that I have for you is this. Um, there's, there's a lady that I know that uh, I, I met her years and years ago, and she told me a story about her mom. Her mom was really sick, and so she went to a local church, a local Pentecostal church, and asked for them to pray for her and, and just wanted to talk about her mom having this illness and dying. And what the person told my friend was, well, we're just going to believe that God's going to heal your mom. That's all we're going to believe. We're going to pray for healing and that's it. And we're going to believe that God's going to heal your mom. And so all she heard was, God's going to heal your mom. God's going to heal your mom. And they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. And she was assured, God's going to heal your mom because we believe that God is a healing God. And, and he's going to heal your mom right up until the point where her mom died. And she was devastated. I thought God healed. I thought God cared. I thought, I thought this is what was going to happen. And now my mom died. And for some of us, that has been our experience as we talk about this loving God being a healing God. What do we do with all of this, this healing stuff? Because we do believe that God can heal, amen? amen? But do we understand why He heals some and doesn't heal others? Do we know the answer to that question? We sure don't know the answer. But some will try and tell you that they do. And I would respond by saying that's hogwash. I was watching some videos. Anybody in the room, you ever heard the name Ravi Zacharias? Raise your hand if you ever heard Ravi Zacharias. Yeah, so Ravi Zacharias, for those of you that don't know, he's, a, he, he's just a brilliant, brilliant 
Christian apologist. Brilliant. And, and he, he enjoys and he's really good at debating the Christian faith defending the Christian faith with scientists and with atheists, and, and, and it's very interesting. And, and if you are very intellectual, I, I would encourage you, look him up and watch some of his stuff, because he's brilliant. If you're like me, you, you want to say, can you dumb it down a little bit? <laughs> can you speak English? But he's great. He's fun to watch, because his arguments, they're not touchy-feely arguments. They're filled with substance, and they're filled with truth, and they're filled with knowledge, and, and so it's great to watch him. And the other day, just in preparing for the message, I found myself watching one of his videos. And honestly, I was wondering, as I'm watching it, kind of just really listening, I thought to myself, why am I wasting my time watching this video? Because it has nothing to do with Matthew chapter 8. It has nothing to do even with healing. And so I'm like, okay, why am I wasting my time here? i got stuff to do. But then I, I, I kept watching, and, and eventually it got to the point where I believe the Lord led me to this was because he made a great statement in this video that I was watching. And here's the statement that he made. The statement that he made is, he said there's a big difference between asking a question and having a doubt. I want you to hear this, because I think this applies when, with the mindset of healing greatly. There's a big difference between having a question and having a doubt. Here's the difference, he says. And when you have a question, what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to understand something. You're wanting to unpack something so that it can make more sense to you. That's what it means to have a question. God, I want to understand healing. I want to understand why you didn't heal her mom. I want to understand why this three-year-old had to die of cancer. I want to understand why you didn't rescue this person's child from addiction. I want to understand why they got so depressed that they committed suicide and you didn't set them free. I want to understand why you didn't rescue this marriage. I want to understand. God, I have questions about this stuff. That's what it means to have a question. And that's a completely different statement than I have a doubt. You see, because I never doubt that God is able. I know He can. I know He can. He created everything, and I know that. He died for my sins, and I know that. One touch of his little finger, and he could restore the life of a dead body. I know that. I don't doubt that. But I question why here and why not here. You see, there's a doubt, a difference between a question and a doubt. When we talk about healing, friends, and I think it's important to understand that. We don't always understand why, but we know that he can. Amen? Amen. Before we get into a couple of points, I, I want to talk about this leper. So why was it important that we went back a couple of verses in Matthew chapter 7? Well, here's why I think it was. Because I think this leper does something that is really unheard of given his disease and given the time he lives, I mean, he, he really did something that's unheard of. He approached somebody, and he shouldn't have. That's the thing about this leper, and, and I know some of you know this. I'm going to remind you of it. Some of you don't, and so I'm going to try and show it to you. A leprosy in Jesus' day, so we're talking 2,000 years ago, a, a, a leper was considered unclean by Levitical law in, 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 for Jews. So if you go back through the book of Leviticus, that's what you're going to find is the law, what's handed down, the guidelines, the directions with which they're supposed to live their lives. And in it, you're going to find things about leprosy. And if you are found to have leprosy, there's a certain way you have to live your life to stay away from your community, to keep your distance, because you don't want to give anybody else this disease. And so this leper, this guy, he has leprosy. He is supposed to announce his presence by saying he's unclean. So imagine that. Imagine you're walking through town. You're walking. You just want to go to the flea market at Kichi Saga Days and get yourself a henna tattoo. As you're walking through all of these crowds of people, you have to be announcing your presence. And not just announcing your presence, but you have to be announcing the fact that you're considered unclean. That you have this disease. You have to keep a certain distance from people. 
you, you're responsible for this so that nobody can come in contact with you. Now this leper, he sees or he hears something of Jesus that makes him go against all of that. And I believe it's found in the last couple of verses of Matthew chapter 7. The people were amazed. Listen, the people were amazed. I believe this leper must have heard something. The people were amazed because he taught as one with authority. There's something about this guy that's different than all of these other blabbermouths that we listen to all the time. There's something different about this guy. And this leper... He's, he's believing something about Jesus at this point. There's something different. There's an authority here that I've never experienced before. There's a possibility here. You mean there's a chance. So you're saying there's a chance. And that's what's going on in this leper's mind. Enough of a chance where he's willing to go against everything he knows he should be doing. There's people around Jesus. This leper's got his eye on Jesus. This leper's paying attention to this man that has authority. And this leper wants his life to be different than it is. And so he approaches him. He goes to him. Goes against everything society is telling him. Goes against the label that society's put on him. Because he sees something in Jesus. Leprosy believed at this point, if you guys have heard the term oral tradition, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a teaching that's just passed on and passed on. It's passed on orally through these rabbis. And so it's believed, and again, it's not in the scripture, but in all these different studies and books and articles and commentaries and stuff, this has been a common thread, believed by first century uh, Judaism. So when Jesus is around, by this point, believed that leprosy had, had not been healed since the Torah was handed down. Hundreds and hundreds of years had not been healed since the Torah is handed down. So by this point, what they believe is that when the Messiah comes, he's going to have the ability to heal leprosy. So now you start putting this all together. Who's the leper think Jesus is? The Messiah, because he hears an authority. What does this leprosy have that he has never had in his life? He has hope. The presence of Jesus in our lives brings hope, friends. And that's what he gave this leper. He gave him hope. Something that he hadn't had, something that the nation of Israel didn't have especially regarding this disease. Incurable. But the Messiah will be able to. And the leper goes against everything he knows to get close to this man. And this is where I, I, I want to just, just talk about two things. Two points that I want to encourage us with today. And for some, maybe, maybe challenge two points. And the first point that I, I want to ask you, I guess, well, if, just write this down. Write this phrase down. Fair weather faith. Fair weather faith. Fair weather faith. Is anybody in here a Vikings fan? I knew you guys. Were, yep, I am for sure. Is anybody in here a Twins fan? Nice. Yep, my boys right here, right in front. Timberwolves? Nice. That's what I'm talking about. Soccer. Well, let's let's we'll go all the way down to soccer. Okay. There's a few of you. I get. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just. Wow. Wow. That's not a violent sport, but you guys got angry right there. It was like, like charge the platform angry. Lacrosse. Crickets. Look at that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. If you're a sports fan, so the Vikings won, and if you you guys. If you know Tommy Brewer, young man, he plays drums, helps with sound, works with the youth. Anytime the Seattle Seahawks lose, would you please find Tommy, send him a text, shoot him a Facebook message, even post it on your walls and make fun of him. Because he is, oh, listen to the mom in the front. Aww. He deserves it. Tommy is this diehard Seattle Seahawks fan. 
But how many of you, if you think of the, the sports that I just talked about, how many of you, like the season is just starting, the Vikings are doing okay, I don't know what the deal was with the kicker the first half of that game, it's like, man, what, seriously? Watching and watching and then hook. But you so see, you're watching the Vikings now, they have a comeback win against Seattle, that's exciting, that's good stuff, but, but as, as you start to watch, not that this has ever been any kind of a pattern with the Vikings, but if by chance this were to happen, where as you're watching the season progress, you're realizing this is going nowhere. Do you stop watching? All of a sudden, when you are wearing the, the purple jersey with great pride, does anybody have a Randy Moss jersey, by the way? Anybody? Man, you ever want to watch a highlight reel? Watch Randy Mo Watch when he was a, oh my gosh, that guy was, a, he was spectacular. It's too bad his attitude wasn't there. But how soon, listen to this, now how soon, if you realize they're going to be a 500 or less team, does that purple jersey go back in the closet, put in the plastic bag, and tucked way in the corner? Or when the Twins, when you realize the pitching's not that great, the batting is poor, it's one error after another in the field, all of a sudden that Maurer jersey, just, yep, we'll just leave that there. Not going to wear that to work anymore. And you know what? Here's the deal. I cannot say a single soccer player. Is there one that I should know? Yeah. No, wait. Look at Doggo right there. Doggo's just dumbfounded. Right? He's just looking at me like, are you serious? <laughs> There's a hundred guys on a soccer team, isn't there? And I don't know one. But if you have your favorite athlete, that jersey that you wear for your team, that you are just, you are this fan of all fans, does that jersey get tucked away when they're doing bad? Or are you a fan I mean, like, are you a diehard fan? It doesn't matter how much the people at church are going to tease you for being a Packer fan, Pam. You're going to wear that jersey with pride. Even though he's retired, you're going to pull out that Brett Favre t-shirt and you're going to wear it with... <laughs> Pushing it, huh, Louie? <laughs> Louie's sitting there going, you don't know my wife, man. You are toast. Wait for your phone to go off in church. You'll experience that. You guys, here's the question. Do you put that jersey away? Do you hide it? Because you're ashamed of it. Because they're not good enough for you. Do you do the same thing with your faith? You believe in God. God is good all the time. But good doesn't equal easy. Now listen to me. Is God God no matter what circumstances enter your life? Or when it doesn't go your way, when the healing doesn't happen, when the addict is still the addict, when the relationship still breaks down, when the finances still go, when the job is lost, is God still God in your life? Or do you have a fair weather faith? You see, because there's so many in our churches, their faith in God is dependent on what he does for them. It's depending on his batting average. It's dependent upon how many 50-yard kicks he can make when it comes down to the wire. It's dependent upon the pass being on target, the catch being pulled in, the fumble not made. Our faith becomes dependent upon that. And when, when I was reading this and I was just praying about this message and stuff, I, I started thinking, you know this leper... I want to have a faith like this leper is what I was thinking. Because you guys, I believe this, and this isn't the scripture, this is just something that's inside of me. Is, and I, wish, I wish I could know, and maybe, maybe someday I'll get to ask him, but I wish I could know what would the leper have done or said if Jesus wouldn't have healed him? If Jesus' response would have been, I am the Messiah, but you believe even if I don't heal you? And, I, and in my heart, you guys, and again, this is not in the Bible, but in my heart, I'm believing that he had, he had a faith that would have lived through e either of those responses. Because I believe that prior to him running up to Jesus, he already believed he was the Messiah. Prior to him going through the crowds, prior to him breaking all of the, all of the mm, 
the laws, all of the regulations and all of the social boundaries that were put in place prior to that. I believe he already had said, this is the Messiah. There is something here that hasn't been. This has got to be him. I believe so greatly that it's him. I am going, I'm going for it, man. I'm in. And he doesn't have a fair weather faith. But I think sometimes that, that in our church, especially in our, in our 2018 faith, it's fair weather. God's just a drive through ATM for us. Give me what I want or I'm going to stop going to church. How many people, people in your circles do you know they don't go to church anymore? Why? Because he died. Because she died. Because he didn't heal them. Because he didn't set them free. Because, because my marriage fell apart. Because my children are, are the prodigals. Because of one thing or another. And therefore we walk away from our faith because God didn't do what I wanted him to do. And you guys, one of the greatest pictures of, of this not having a fair weather faith, I think is found in Daniel chapter 3. And you don't have to turn there, but jot it down, because if you're not familiar, I, I, go read it this week. You see, in Daniel chapter 3, there's this, this great story, a historical account of, of what happened. Three of Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these young Hebrew kids, they're, they're uprooted, they're brought to Babylon, and they're indoctrinated with all of this stuff, and they're being told now that they have to worship this image. And they don't want to worship this image. They're refusing to worship this image, even though the punishment is death, being thrown into a fiery furnace that's heated beyond heated. Like this thing is hot, the Bible says. And so these guys know if they don't worship this image, they're going to get thrown in and die. And they make this profound statement. I think it's right around verse 18. They make this super powerful statement. They say this. They say, our God is able to save us from this. That's amazing faith, isn't it? They're standing by the door like, like their hair is singeing. And they're standing there. This is what's in store for them if they choose not to worship this idol. If they choose to remain faithful to God, that's what's in store for them. And this is real life stuff. This is just like three of you, three of us. It's the same thing. They're human. It's hot. And they say, our God is able. Now that's a great statement of faith. Don't you agree? But I think the next one is even a greater statement of faith. Because what they say is, but... But, even if he doesn't, we will not waver. Now that's powerful. Facing death. God is God and he is able. But even if he chooses not to, I will still follow him. I will still have faith in him. I will still believe in him. And when I think about this leper and I think of everything that he is doing away with, is he supposed to be over here? And understand something more about the leper. It's written in the law, Leviticus, it's around like chapters 13 and 14, I believe. But there's a spot in there where legally people could stone the leper if he's getting too close. So now it's not just that you're going to run up. It's not just that the leper's like, okay, I'm going I'm to go for it. You know, Jason, I'm... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go up there. You know, we're lepers together. You're in now, just so you know. You're stuck. I'm going for it. Jason would stop. He'd say, whoa, whoa hold on, leper Bill. <laughs> hold on a second, because here's the deal. If you start getting too close, they can stone you. They can start throwing rocks at you to keep you away from them. This is what this leper is thinking. This is how I think sure he is of who this person is. This is what he's willing to risk. I believe this is the Messiah. And again, it's not written in here, but it's, it's in my heart that I, I think he was thinking. But, and I know he, he can heal me. But even if he doesn't, I'm willing to risk it because I believe he's the Messiah. Friends, today as you find yourself sitting in the church, is the Spirit stirring something inside of you that says you have a fair weather faith? Is the Spirit stirring something inside of you that, that you're recognizing, like this is why I'm keeping God so far away? Because he didn't answer this. 
because he didn't do this, because he didn't heal this, he didn't save this, he didn't do, he didn't do, he didn't do. And because he doesn't have a good enough batting average, too bad for you, God. You start doing better, maybe I'll think about coming back. Friends, that's a fair weather faith, and I just want to encourage you today, if God's stirring that inside of you, man, ask him to help you with that. Ask God to help you with that. Because God is God. Our circumstances and our situation never change who he is, and God is good all the time. Even when it's not easy, God is still good. Amen? Amen. Second thing I, I, I want to talk about today is this. And uh, this is where I think it gets interesting. The second thing is this. Uh, write this down. Jesus loves you just the way you are. Jesus loves you. Isn't that good to know? Jesus loves you. Even Leper Jason. <laughs> we should get shirts made. I'm with Leper Jason. <laughs> more, more powerful than that statement that Jesus loves you. Here's, here's, here's one for you. Jesus ain't afraid to get his hands dirty. Jesus ain't afraid to get his hands dirty. And now there's, in, in studying all this stuff, again, you guys, I, I'm not very smart, so I, I try and read a lot, try and learn a lot. And there's this great theological debate that takes place over different parts of Scripture. It doesn't really change a whole lot. But it's just these different theological debates. And, and as you read and study, this is one of the places where you find this theological debate. So this whole idea of Jesus touching a leper, it's, it's a big deal. Jesus touching a leper. Because you have to understand something. For those of you that don't know, listen to this. Jesus is Jewish. Okay? If you didn't know that, Jesus is Jewish. Um, another thing, just since we're on that topic, the Jews, the Jews are not our enemies. And I, and I know for some Christians, some of you are thinking, well, duh, everybody knows that. Well, no, that's not true. There are some people who think that the Jews are our enemies and that we should hate them. They're not. The, they're, our, they're our ancestors in the faith. Jesus is a Jew. And Jesus is ministering at this time to a lot of Jewish people in Jewish communities. And so Jesus goes to this leper as a Jew. And if Jesus touches this leper, what does that make him? Unclean. Okay, now this is now enter in this great theological debate, this whole cool stuff. It's exciting. You're all sitting at me like, dude, you've got to get, get a life. Find a sports team or something. Watch soccer. That's what you're all thinking right now. Watch soccer. It's exciting. This is exciting. So... Jesus isn't afraid to get his hands dirty. Write that down or get it tattooed on your forearm. Jesus ain't. If you get a tattoo, write ain't, though, because it's just cooler. At this moment in time, something happens that doesn't need to happen because you've got to understand something, you guys. Jesus did not have to touch the leper to heal the leper. Amen? Amen. Jesus could have said, and, and next week we're going to talk about the centurion's servant, and Jesus just said the word, and he's, they're healed and from a ways away. Jesus did not have to touch the leper. Jesus could have said, Jesus, be clean. But he doesn't do that. So here's the thing. Different thoughts, okay? Did Jesus ever sin? He didn't sin. Nope, Jesus did not sin. On that we can agree, okay? Um, is it a sin to be unclean? I don't think it is, because if you look at the law, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find that, and this is going to make some of you uncomfortable, but we're just going to say this. You're going to find that a woman is considered unclean while she has her period. So is it a sin for a woman to have her period? Now, I'm going to, I'm going to make one statement that will get me in a lot of water. Hot water. The furnace is getting hot right now. I'm now not going to make my statement. So here's the thing to understand is this. You guys, he doesn't sin. Is it a sin to be unclean? Nope. So here's the thoughts. One, thing, uh, one school of thought is this, is that Jesus did not become unclean when he touched the leper because at this point in time, he tapped into the, the God part of his being. And, and because he's God, he's so holy that it's just not possible for him to become unclean. 
So that's one school of thought. I personally, my opinion, I don't like that school of thought. Because I believe the Bible is very clear that Jesus became human. And if Jesus can relate to me and Phil as humans, that means he can't just decide, okay, well, I'm going to be God right now, and I'm going to touch this person, and, and I'm so holy that I can't become unclean. I don't agree with that. Because I think Jesus is as human as every one of us is in this place. Only he didn't sin. So that's one school of thought. Another school of thought is this, is it was a timing issue. It was a timing issue where at just the mo like, like like this is you know, one one hundredth of a second type timing, where at just the right time, when Jesus, that, that essentially he's saying this, the leper was already clean before Jesus touched him. And so he didn't touch the person with leprosy. That's another school of thought. It, it was a timing thing, that by the time Jesus touched him, he was already clean. That's another one. Do you know what I think? I think Jesus ain't afraid to get his hands dirty. That's what I think. Now listen to the power that's in this right here. Jesus didn't have to touch the leper. But I think Jesus knew what the leper needed. Now, now listen to me. A leper, they cannot touch somebody. If I'm even getting close to you like this, you're throwing rocks at me. There's not a chance in hell that, that you're going to let me touch you. So now, however long I've had leprosy, here's the deal. Have I experienced affection? Have I experienced a loving touch? Have I experienced anything like that? Absolutely no, I haven't experienced it. Explain to me why Jesus touched a leper that he didn't have to touch to heal him. I believe it's because he knew exactly what this person needed. He knew exactly what this man needed. He, he's going to heal him. All he has to do is say a word, and, and this, this, this leper's healed. But instead he walks up and he does the unheard of. He does the unthinkable, and he touches the leper. And, and in that touch, he says, I love you. He says, I accept you. He says, I'm going to heal you. And I'm not just going to heal you, but I'm going to make you clean. See, there's a physical healing that takes place. And, and now all of these sores, all of this white scaly stuff that's all over his body, it's gone and he's physically healed. But Jesus doesn't just physically heal the leper. He makes him clean. And what does making him clean mean? Making him clean means... Now you can be part of the family. Now you can, you can come to the synagogue. You can go to the temple. You can be around your community. As you watch people walk by in their clutters, imagine this. Imagine, Sarah, you're at school, and you, you have leprosy, and so you got to just sit there on the bench while you watch all of your friends walk 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 feet away from you. And you don't get to be part of that community. You don't get to laugh and joke and sit around and play Fortnite together. You don't get to do all that stuff. But now all of a sudden, you have the courage to run to the Messiah, the one that you believe can heal you. And he doesn't just physically heal you, but he cleanses you. He restores you. And he gives this leper so much more than just a physical healing. And I believe that he sends this message so perfectly with that touch. The Son of God touching a leper. The Son of God touching the untouchable. The Son of God loving the unlovable. Choosing to, not having to, but choosing to. And now, church, I want to ask you this question. What is the, lepros the leprosy that's in your life? What's the leprosy that's in your life that's making you feel like he doesn't want anything to do with me? And, and, and I know I look around, and I know almost every one of you and I know some of you, you've been in church for a lot of years, and you know what? There's still something inside of you that's keeping God at a, a far off distance because you think, I can't approach him. Last night I, after the service, I talked with a gentleman. And he said, man, that was so good because 
the Lord stirred in me things that happened when I was a kid, and this guy's older than me. Stuff that's making him think, you just, you just, you just don't want it. And this guy's been in the church for a long time. You see, we have to remember things like this. Jesus is not afraid to get his hands dirty. Whatever you brought in here, whatever your life circumstances have been, whatever been, has been done to you or whatever you've done, be like the leper. Understand and trust that, that you can just run to Jesus. Cut through the cart. Crowds, don't let anybody hinder you from getting to Jesus, from getting to the one that can heal you, cleanse you, and restore you. Don't let anybody stand in your way. You guys this morning, why don't you stand for a minute? Here's what I want to, I want to ask you this question. I want you to consider it, and, and I want you to make a choice. Last week we talked about doing the message last week, it was called Doing Makes the Difference. You see, we can sit here, maybe right now God is bringing stuff like this man last night. Maybe he's bringing stuff to the surface in your life. Maybe you're young, maybe you're old. Maybe it's something that happened last night or this morning. Maybe it happened 40, 50 years ago. Maybe it's a burden that's been with you forever. Maybe it's a lifestyle that you're wrestling with. Whatever it is, God right now, he's, he's bringing this to the surface in you. And I want you to understand that it's the doing that makes the difference. It's what you do with what God is stirring. The leper had to make a choice. He had to do. He, he could have stayed over in that corner. He could have kept his distance. He could have kept the boundary that, that the culture told him to keep, or he could have chose, which he did, to do. He chose to do. He chose to believe. He chose to see. He chose to get beyond what everybody else was doing and run to the one that could heal, cleanse, and restore him. He chose to do. He didn't let anybody hinder him. He ran, and he makes this just unbelievable statement. God, if you're willing, if you are willing, you can heal me and you can make me clean. If you are willing, I believe that you can do this. I believe that you can set me free. In church tonight, I want to ask you this. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that he is the Messiah? Do you believe that he has the authority? Do you believe that he, can, that he can do what none other can do? Do you believe? And are you willing to do? Jesus ain't afraid to get his hands dirty. Jesus ain't afraid to touch those that no one else will. Whatever you've done, whatever you're doing, it doesn't scare him. Are you willing to bring it to him? Dear Father, right now we just want to ask for this, God, just for your healing touch in this place.